Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. It's good to have you all with us once again, as always. Now, the two men who you're about to meet who are going to join us today, you may know. Eddie Conway is an executive producer here at The Real News. He's host of Rattle the Bars, who came here after serving 44 years as a political prisoner because he was a leader and a member of the Black Panther Party. The other man is a guest here as well. You may have met him before on The Real News. Eddie's best friend, former defense captain for the Black Panthers, founder of the Black Classic Press, Paul Coates. Now, their friendship is a powerful and has a depth that most men yearn for. That relationship was captured in a book called The Brother You Choose. Paul Coates and Eddie Conway talk about life, politics, and the revolution. It was edited by Susie Day, who from a long series of interviews she did with them, created this book. It's a sojourn of two men, one incarcerated, the other on the outside, always with them, having each other's back. It's the story of a deep friendship and the political struggles that defined it and our whole nation. Paul Coates and Eddie Conway join me now via Zoom to explore their friendship, their politics, the revolution, the racism at the center of our world and the center of their worlds as well. And brothers, welcome. Good to have you both with us. Mark, thank Thanks. you. Thanks for having me. Uh, this, this is an amazing book. Susie really did an amazing job. Um, I look forward to talking to her just about how she did this. I mean, she captured something. And clearly, you know, it made me think of this as I was reading it. For you to have this conversation with Susie, there had, to be a lot, there had to be trust all the way around for this kind of conversation to happen. Hmm. That's, a, that's, a, that's a good point and something that I didn't so much think about at the time because the conversation, on, at least from my perspective, um, the conversation was preceded really by me knowing Susie on the outside, Eddie knowing Susie on the inside, but also, Susie had done such a wonderful article, uh, Mark, when Eddie got out. And it was the best capture that I had seen of what was happening around Eddie getting out and his transition from being confined. So I think that article and knowing her, uh, knowing her partner, Laura, um, created that trust. And it didn't give me grounds to think about it again. No, I just thought about it just from the, the book made me think that. I mean, clearly you wouldn't yeah. have been able to do that without it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, uh -huh. no, I think that's a good point. So let, let me begin this way. I mean, um, unless, Eddie, you want to jump in on that as well. No, I'm good. All right, cool. So... Uh, <laughs> 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 I, obviously, we trust her. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to take this back to the beginning here. Let's talk about the way your friendship grew. I mean, after your initial meeting, the way you do it in the book is um, that neither of you quite remembers how it happened, nor quite remembers whether you really liked each other, but you met at the kind of height of Cointopo, which we can talk about. And, and I know, Eddie, on page 67 of the book, early in the book, you just make these horrific descriptions of, of Cointopo and what that meant. So your almost friendship began the Panthers, um, but really developed as a result of that war on the Panthers, the federal government's war on the Panthers. So, I mean, talk about that beginning of the two of you, both of you Army veterans, both of you coming into the Panthers. Eddie had already been there, and you walk into it, Paul. So, Eddie, why don't you jump off? Mm -hmm. During those days, you know, because you're, you're talking now, 69, when Cointel Pro Operations was in full effect. Uh, it, it was uh, a hectic time uh, with the chapters, with people that we were training in other locations and so on. Um, and so for me, uh, it was beyond working and working with the breakfast program. It was always hectic trying to find out what was going on, who was who, and, uh, that, and investigating things and so on. So I... Paul, actually, uh, the, the, the real first memory I have of Paul and I interacting was around the problem with the newspapers out at the airport. Uh, uh, the newspapers were uh, uh, under attack by the FBI, of course. They were damaging them, uh, misshipping them, uh, putting uh, various chemicals in them to make them unsellable. Uh, and so we were having this backlog problem out at the airport and Paul was in the position at that time to help kind of straighten it out. And I think that was the first thing that I can remember 
us actually doing together was fixing that problem. It's real interesting because that period is an early period for me as well. And I remember Eddie as just being this established panther. You know, he he was a panther. I was a community worker. And even the incident that's it's interesting, the incident that he's talking about, I used to work for United Airlines. I used to do ground service. And so I had some access and facility around the uh, airport, but I also was able to use some of that knowledge to help get the Panther paper in. And I think it's critical with what Eddie's talking about because uh, people may not understand now why the COINTELPRO would be so interested in the party uh, as paper, but that paper actually was lifeblood to us. Uh, the chapters around the country supported themselves by selling the newspaper. They kept a portion of the proceeds to fund their operation. They sent a portion of the proceeds from selling the newspaper back to our central headquarters in California. Bottom line is, everybody loved Eddie Conway, you know? I mean, he was Eddie and he was the Panther and he was loved. And I couldn't figure out what was so big about this guy. You know? <laughs> I just couldn't figure out. So uh, later, uh, when I when I became in charge of the chapter, and of course Eddie and Eddie and so many of us were under charges. And I, by this time, Eddie was in jail. I had been arrested. I was in jail for a period of time with him. We we actually formed a trust and a relationship out of the whole experience of that. And so it was a matter of being incarcerated. It was a matter of understanding that he was behind the walls carrying the banner of the struggle that we were carrying on in the street. And it was our responsibility and my responsibility, of course, to support him and the other people because uh, we, we all were in it. So I want to come back to that. Closer. We became closer out of, out of that for me. I want people to understand because there are many people who are watching us now you know, don't know what COINTELPRO was, don't know what that moment was. And you, in your conversations with Susie and Paul, really captured it. And I, I'm, I'm gonna give you a little hint. I mean, you were, it was like around page 67, you really captured this um, when you talked about Fred Hampton and Bunchy Carter and John Higgins and the Klan blowing up, possibly blowing up the offices in, in Des Moines, the Panther 21 in New York, all that was going on. I mean, getting a sense of the horrendous weight that was on top of the Panthers at the moment you two met and when you were both active? Well, yeah, one of, one of the things uh, I think it's important at this point is that we did not know about COINTELPRO. What we knew was that there were attacks taking place against our members. There was uh, disruptions in our logistics uh, and activities. Uh, there was, um, death and destruction uh, randomly across the country, whether it was uh, in uh, Texas or wherever. And uh, we didn't know it was a coordinated effort, uh, but we knew that we were under attack and most of it seemed to be random or locally orchestrated. Um, and so we were kind of addressing it as a local issue all the way up until probably the, the, uh, the middle of 69 when we uh, put together uh, uh, United Front to Combat Fascism. At that point, we had already realized that what we were experiencing was some type of fascist attack, uh, but we did not know that the government was orchestrating it all uh, in a in, in a manner that coordinated from, actually it was, uh, we were under attack around the world, not just in the United States of America, but in uh, uh, London and in Africa and in other places too. Picking up, Paul, what you were talking about last was I, I was thinking about the, what really kind of began to cement the world between you. Eddie was falsely accused and arrested of, of murdering a cop and began his 40 odd plus years, 44 years as a political prisoner. And the beginning 
Um, it was actually Eddie's incarceration and your fallout with the Panthers that also may have been involved in Pro, uh, unbeknownst to either one of you, that led to you becoming, as you put it, brothers for life, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're right there, Mark. And something about that, um, one of the things, uh, I was talking to my wife about this uh, last night, and this is in part, I, th I think it's covered in the book as well, Eddie goes to, Eddie is charged, Eddie goes to trial. They don't really have witnesses against Eddie. They have a cop that claims he saw him for 30 seconds. They have another jail informant that was put into his cell, a professional informant that was put into his cell. Those are the two witnesses, okay? And they build a case a, 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 a around that. The thing about it is that witness, Charles Reynolds, in order to add credibility to his story, he said that Eddie was on a mission the night of his birthday and that I had given him marijuana and cough syrup and sent him on that mission. Now, you have to remember, I wasn't even in the party <laughs> at the time. But by the time Eddie went to trial, I was. And I was in charge of, of that chapter by that time. But I remember what I'm saying. Eddie was Mr. Panther when, when I came. Well, I looked like sending him on a mission. The, the point is, knowing that that was false was one thing. Proving it to be false was something that we could, I mean, it, for 30 years until that man, I guess he's dead now because he was very close to death, until we found him, the informant, Charles Reynolds, who oh, we yeah, did that, find. That. We found him and... Um, had people talk to him about, you know, about testifying to the truth that he lied about. We could never get that done, and consequently, Eddie stayed in jail. But what always struck me, Mark, was the fact that I always would say, there but for the grace of God go I. Because the fact that he said, I sent Eddie on that mission, if the police had wanted to, really, really, if they had wanted to, they would have constructed a case against me. I always knew that whenever I visited Eddie um, in the jail, I knew that what was holding him in the jail was this flimsy testimony, largely from this jail informant, that he had insisted he didn't want in his cell, but the informant was put in his cell. And that's how the state got him. That's how the state held him for 44 years. Anyway, our friendship, you know, was, was grounded in that knowledge, Mark, as part of it. And I think part of what really, you know, I've heard you say this in different ways before over the years, but something you said in the conversation with Susie and, and, um, Beth and Eddie was how you define the power of friendship, mm -hmm. which really to me was like, it's really important to kind of talk about that because it's something that I think we lose all too often. And, and again, um, it was under that piece in the book that's called, um, These Cats Were My Responsibility. Mm -hmm. And you, you talk very clearly about what commitment and friendship means and why that happened between you and Eddie while he was inside and you said no to the, how some of the panther leadership naturally wanted to handle things and how you thought it needed to be handled because of your notion of, of what it meant to be a friend and what it meant to stand by somebody through the revolutionary stuff. And you actually, both you didn't quite agree on some stuff, but this was cemented. It, this is, to me, is a defining moment, just in terms of the two of you. But I, I, you started out, Paul, then I want, I want Eddie to jump in. I mean, that's a, a, a ground, and, and, and it's true. Eddie went into the jail as, as a panther. And, you know, that meant a whole lot of things. It meant that people in the jail had expectations of him. You know, people were waiting for him to come in for the leadership. The prison authority was in there waiting for him to come in because they had their imagination of him. And of course, he had his own feelings about the environment. Through all of those pressures, he remained consistent. He remained a principled person. And most important to me, he, you, you know, he didn't break under the pressure. He held his own and always there was pressure. There was always pressure, but he proceeded in a cool-headed manner. And most importantly, I could always count on what he said. I could always count on what he said coming out of his mouth, and I could bank on that. 
He never went backwards on me. He never uh, betrayed, you know, the, the person that he set out to be. From day one until he got out of there, he fought for the people who were in jail with him. And he did it in a principal way, a way that I could support. And so I, I definitely loved that about him and still love it about him because he's still committed. The day he got out, I told him to take a break, you know? This guy goes to work down in Gilmore Homes or some some old stuff, man. Say, okay, man, you gonna take you gonna take a break? Yeah, 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 yeah. He did lie to me about that now, he did. But I still love him, he's my brother, you know what I mean? <laughs> Eddie, I don't know if Eddie understands what it means to take a break. Um, Eddie, I mean, and, and at that moment, it was also, as you all talked about together in the book, in these conversations, Paul had gone to Paul had gone west and Oakland, the Panthers wanted to stay out there. They wanted to change their whole way of doing things. And Paul said, no, he has men to take care of. We're back here in Baltimore. And you had very different views in that sense of, of, what it meant, of, of the relationship with the Panthers at that moment. But something was also occurring, both in terms of you being inside and how you had to stand up. And this man, Paul Coates, on the outside, who was standing with you. So pick up on that, Eddie. Yeah, I think, you know, at that time also, um, the party was was uh, having some internal problems uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, Huey and Eldridge Cleaver's relationship and the split between the, uh, the, the party itself and a couple chapters actually uh, decided to go underground and not the whole chapters, but some of the people from the chapters and formed that uh, uh, BLA and uh, the Black Liberation Army, that is. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Paul, you know, and everybody else was pulled to California, like shut everything down, forget everybody that's left behind. Uh, and not exactly because uh, uh, in, in my particular case, uh, 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 Richmond, Virginia was a sign. And of course, you know how far away that is a sign mm -hmm. to kind of like keep keep up with me and stay in contact. But it wasn't the kind of support that you needed on the ground when you were in the kind of the Maryland penitentiary environment with all of those different factors. Paul saw that and decided to come back mm -hmm. and organize here and give that support. And of course, it, it, you know, and it's in the book, there was a conflict like, well, okay, Paul is no longer <clears throat> acceptable comrade to deal with. Uh, and you, uh, you need not to talk to him and your, your love, your loyalty and relationship is with California. And basically I said, well, yeah, all that's true, but Paul is here for me. Mm -hmm. And Paul is back here to make sure that we aren't abandoned. And so I'm going to stick with him if y'all get mad, y'all just get mad, whatever mm -hmm. happens. I had always sided with the party central and in general anyway, but on that particular thing, I said, no, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we had a, was establishing from the time we spent in jail, uh, the time we worked on the street and to the time he actually got back, we had established a friendship somewhere in the middle of that, that I knew I could depend on him and I could rely on whatever he said was gonna happen. And I knew that I wanted to make sure that that was true on my part also. Whatever mm -hmm. I said was going on uh, would be what would be happening or what I would do. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the struggle itself, uh, cemented our relationship and and COINTELPRO forced us to make some choices mm -hmm. that end up uh, resulting in a lifelong friendship. That whole period, you know, I left Baltimore. I was one of the first people to go to um, California. What Eddie's talking about is that whole strategy that the Panther had of closing down chapters that were all around the country, bringing those people out to Oakland, California, and building a base of operations in Oakland 
and from Oakland taking over the city, you know, politically and what have you. And following that, they ran Bobby Seale for mayor and things like that, you know. Well, it, it, that that may have worked fine, but it wasn't it wasn't working for Baltimore, you know, and it wasn't working for uh, the people who were under charges in Baltimore. I left and went out to California thinking that I was going out there for training, not that I was going to leave those people in jail. And I ended up staying out there. And as m I also thought I could, I was going out there and, and we were going to discuss the case. How are we going to bring legal support to these people in jail? That was the farthest thing from central headquarters brain. We never, never, I, I was out there all of November. I was out there uh, December. I left in January. Not one time not one time was there ever a meeting or a discussion about people who were in jail in California. And so I left. I mean, I, I, it, the contradictions was too much. I also had young children here in, in, in Baltimore. And I would, have, I would have separated. I separated myself from my family. But not on this, not on betrayal, not on abandonment. I, I couldn't do that. That wasn't revolution to me, Mark. <laughs> I, I come back and I shared that with Eddie. Now he's saying, well, he told them no. But the truth is, I went in to see him. And in that, in, in that moment, he and there were two other brothers. I went in to see each of them. And in that moment, I told him what had happened. I told him I had been out in California. They had not even been informed that I had been suspended from the party, okay? Or booted out of the party, whatever. They hadn't been informed of that. I informed them of it and told them that, you know, like you guys are not gonna be able to deal with me and stuff like that. And they say, I'm not supposed to deal with you, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna be here for you anyway. Eddie's response was F that man, <laughs> I'm going with you. You know, on the moment, it wasn't like he took a week to think about it. It wasn't like he took a day to think about it. When I left that jail, I knew that I was going to, that you know, because I told him, I said, look, whichever way you go, it doesn't matter. I'll be there. I'll, you know, help you with it and what have you. But if you deal with me, the party's going to ban you. He made a decision on the spot. And that said to me, I was in, you know, I was in. And stayed. I mean, but that also, stayed, of course. Yeah, you stayed. I mean, I, I also know you from years and years and that's part of your character like you stay with mm -hmm. your children you stay with your yeah. friends you yeah. don't abandon people um yeah. and neither does eddie yeah and and so but in that time when you were inside eddie and and you were on the outside things were actually still bubbling and moving i mean there was this george jackson prison movement the the black books that sort of the story you started the the organizing with the uh, 1199 e organizing inside paul taking his children inside the prison there, there was something going on then that really the movement was alive inside, and you were in some ways called a conduit outside, talking with Eddie all the time. But mm -hmm. on the inside, Eddie, you were doing serious organizing. The stuff was moving, um, and from the George Jackson movement to the books Paul brought in, all the rest. So let's give a sense of the flavor of that moment before we charge into a little bit later on in the book. One of the things we had to contend with, we had several movements going across the country in the prison system. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, on the West Coast, you had uh, the George Jackson, uh, uh, Black Gorilla family kind of activities uh, for self-defense because Black prisoners out there obviously were always under attack from either white supremacists, the guards, or Latinos, or so on. So I, everybody have to kind of like arm and train and organize to just take care business and stay alive from day to day. Uh, but on the East Coast, you had a different kind of movement up in New York, uh, where there was a massive uh, prison organizing that eventually led to Attica. Um, and what we thought down here was that, uh, in Maryland that is, uh, inside the penitentiary, is that we would do a hybrid, we would do a combination of both. One, we would put ourselves in the position to protect ourselves. But two, we would organize, we would do mass organizing 
but not for rides. Unfortunately, we had a number of rides uh, that's unavoidable because you can't control that. Somebody get mad over the chicken and the place will blow up, mm. right? Uh, <laughs> but we decided to organize the population by organizing programs. And we thought that, well, where the rubber actually meets the road in the prison system is the slavery, the money, the fact mm. that they could work us for nine cents an hour, the fact mm. that we were producing two, three, and four hundred dollars worth of goods every day. Uh, and we were just making enough to buy a pack of cigarettes at the end of that day. We figured if we organize a labor union, demand minimum wages, that would cripple them right there because they would stop making the money. Then they would also stop needing to lock people up because there was no more free jobs. Hmm. And that in itself was the course we went down. And what we found out after Attica, after George Jackson, it's like there was more negative reaction to organizing a prison labor union in the prison system than there was for us doing violence uh, or reacting to mm, violence mm, or doing mm. cases where they were massive rides. They were they welcome the rides. At the end of the ride, they sweep up, they clean up, they lock everybody in, they transfer people out, they charge everybody. And so for the next four or five years, the place was peaceful. So they welcomed those rides, but they did not welcome massive organizing that threatened their money. And while that was going on, Paul, what were you, 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 were, you were also building your life outside. You were creating Black Classic Press. You started a bookstore. I mean, and these, but these things, these were not disconnected. You, you, you know, Mark, the, the thing about commitment um, to Eddie and I, I, you know, one of the hardest visits I had with Eddie was like going to see him in the jail, knowing that even at that time I had I had uh, five kids, Mark, five kids that I was concerned with, had no idea of how I was going to support them, but going to see him in jail and realizing that I, although we started doing it. I could not spend my life out on the corner holding signs. I could not, with good conscience, um, be doing chicken dinners and, and raising money for support when I knew that I had to deal with my family in some kind of way or the other. And not, not that I've, oh, I've been a big earner or anything like that, but that was a hard conversation for me to have with Eddie, who immediately said, man, yeah, you, you gotta do what you think. Once we had that conversation, I began looking for ways to you know, support myself, support my family and do political work. And one of the things that came out of it, I used to drive a cab, me and a, uh, uh, me and a few other brothers used to drive a cab. Out of that money and out of money that we collected in the community, we were able to build a bookstore that had as its component the bookstore. Um, later, it was supposed to grow to a publishing company, and later it was supposed to go to a printing company. That was, and and that was to give employment or help give employment to people who were incarcerated, who came out, give them a place to get started, connect them to the political education. So we were supplying books from from the bookstore into the jail to Eddie in that early effort. Like Eddie ran into to, uh, problems with, with the union and the organizing he was doing, we ran into problems early on too that caused a disruption and a change from the prison program, the active prison program that we had created. And we became, we were still the George Jackson prison movement, but we became more focused on the bookstore and doing some of the work like the Panthers used to do, like with free food, free clothes and things like that. We would do that work out of the George Jackson Prison Movement and the Black Book on Pennsylvania Avenue. So it began from that. It evolved over the years, Mark. It evolved over the years. And one day I looked around 10 years later and said, this actually, this thing actually is a business. It's not a prison movement anymore. And we've got to treat it like a business. We had, we had employees, we had bills. 
and that became the Black Classic Press. You know, we, we had been call, began calling it that after that time. But it began out of the work we were doing with, with Eddie. He and I put our heads together. We agreed on the program. And that's how we began. The fact that you two did this and Black Classic Press all this stuff began while Eddie was inside, but the depth of your trust with one another that you started this movement outside that became a business, which is an incredible business that brings us books that were lost to humankind from black authors throughout the centuries. An amazing, uh, uh, amazing, uh, powerful work. But that Eddie, you were part of that, integral to it. It wasn't something you were separate <laughs> from. I mean, that's, that, that's for some people, it'd be hard to wrap your head around. Here's Eddie doing Life Plus 30. And, inside fighting to get out and fighting to organize and you're doing something outside but it always remained connected <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's that's crazy <laughs> yeah yeah it, it is and you got some because i if, if you you in the house, i'll say something you know? <laughs> <laughs> then, you know like um Eddie, Eddie was like, like he's doing life in 30. Now you have to understand, Mark, most days we didn't have money to pay for nothing. I mean, nothing at all, you know? And so I'm going to visit him, right? But we aren't necessarily talking about his case. We, I mean, we might spend some time talking about it, but other than that, it's like a woe is me. He was my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he needs a therapy degree, man. And he, he would he would look at me, man, and shake his head. <laughs> Woo, boy! Yeah, by the time I left, I was cool. We could go back out and start again. <laughs> Paul told me, and I, I can't even remember what sparked the conversation, but we were talking about drowning, mm. and Paul said. You know, you can drown in an ocean mm -hmm. and or you can drown in a bathtub, but you're still drowned. Mm -hmm. And so that person in the bathtub, even though it looks like a little a bunch of little problems, mm -hmm. has the same serious problem as that person in that ocean. Mm -hmm. They're both drowning and it's both deadly serious to them. Mm -hmm. And I always, when I came in contact with people, when I interacted, that was one of the earlier things that came out of Paul and our discussion. Mm -hmm. And I always would look at a person and I wouldn't judge because probably I, I can't remember what it was, but somebody had pissed me off or didn't do something that they should have did. It was a minor thing, but they had a minor excuse for it. And I was like, no, that's not acceptable. That's not like being in the ocean drowning. <laughs> and that, that brought me some clarity with how I would deal with people from then on in. And it certainly helped me deal with people through that 44 years in prison, mm -hmm. because I always had the ability to look at the large and the small and see them equally as serious for whatever that person was feeling. Mm -hmm. So I think that was beneficial. And that was one of the things that I learned from our friendship. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking mm -hmm. the other thing, of course, is critical thinking, because mm -hmm. uh, Paul was, I, I don't think I was, I, I don't know if I was full of myself, but mm -hmm. I thought I knew everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't even know how I got there. I mean, I did know a lot, but I thought I knew everything. And so I wasn't even doing critical thinking, because as far as I was concerned, what I thought what's the way it should be. And I could, my paradigm covered the world in history. Mm. And so I know you can't tell me anything. <laughs> and I would just jump on people if they tried to tell me stuff. And then Paul said, and in his subtle way, which is, <laughs> is he's still subtle now. He'll say, well, yeah, brother, uh, I, I, I can see that. I can see that. You know, one of the things that I always, that always comes up to me is this. And he would throw in the monkey wrench that would make you step back and say, oh yeah, okay, all right. You know, and that critical thinking and that empathy for the big and the small, I think was something that I got from our friendship that was very valuable. 
and, and in the process of all that, I mean, one of the things that, that, that hit me in these discussions you were having with Susie Day was that over the years, and even now, even after you come home, maybe over the years, how both of you define revolution and being a revolutionary was really very different and changed mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't change your relationship, but clearly it, it just, I mean, you have very different ideas. They're connected, but different, mm -hmm. you know? And your friendship not only survived that, but in some ways, I think it helped each other grow, challenging each other on the way, but what you mean by revolution, what it means to be a revolutionary mm -hmm. from the inside and the outside. That's one thing mm -hmm. that I got out of this. It was really heavy in this book. Yeah. I, I think, Mark, for me, um, the Panther Party gave me revolution and it took it from me. You know? Mm -hmm. Like the, the insincerity toward all those people who had been arrested in Baltimore and arrested around the country. And the fact that you can operate an organization, supposedly revolutionary, and not be, you can be concerned about some people who are in jail, particularly the ones that were in California. You can really be focused and concerned about them, but you can't extend that to other people it pulled the covers off of me. And when I came back to Baltimore from California, I was like adrift. I, I mean, I was clearly I wasn't a revolution because I had left the revolution in California. I didn't do what they said do. And so I couldn't claim being a revolutionary anymore. And, I, and as I looked at this and looked at this, I, you, you know, like, I would have. I was one of them cats that would have carried a revolution in a big R around my neck or something like that. I am. I want to be like Fred. I am a revolutionary. You know, all. Of, but it wasn't working when I got back. There were people, you know, actual people in jail that I didn't have the power to get out. I had the power to stand with them, but I didn't have the power to get out. I had children that I could barely take care of. And were it not for the mothers, were it not for the grandparents, I wouldn't have been able to do that. What am I talking about revolutionizing? The only thing that I could see, the only revolution for me meant getting books to people, you know, fighting the battle on that end. But it wasn't the same. So I stripped, you know, I, I, I stripped myself of it, but I think it, in large part, it had to do with the Panthers taking that, showing me the reality for myself. So I would never call myself a revolutionary. I, I just would not. I do engage in change. I like that, you know? Mm -hmm. I still consider myself a revolutionary. Right. What I did not know at that time, and what most people don't know most of the time when they use that kind of terminology, is that it's different in every different century. It's different what was a revolutionary in the uh, um, uh, bourgeoisie period or the feudal system, et cetera, that changed the, the, the actions that they did in France, the French Revolution, so on and so on. That had a meaning then that changed stuff. Uh, what we look at Chairman Mao or we look at those, uh, the Russian Revolution, so on, all of that stuff changes constantly according to the time, the era, what's at stake, uh, and how you address that particular thing. Today, to me, a revolutionary is someone that's concerned about saving the planet, saving the species on the planet, changing the conditions in which most of the people live in. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean socialism, because we don't know what socialism actually is, and it's diff it differs from experiment to experiment to experiment. But at the same time, we have no idea what the end results of all of this will look like. But we do know that change is one of those consistent things and that we need to apply it. But we need to apply it in, uh, in the parameters and the geography and the culture and the economics of our particular time. And 
that takes us forward. But having said all that, the the Black Panthers itself didn't sour me because as I look back, I realized that shit, we got our ass kicked really bad because we thought we could go up against an empire and we felt comfortable enough to do it and it was a, it was foolish but it was also like Chairman Mao say the foolish old man that thought he could move the mountain you know uh, we couldn't but other people now are picking up shovels and they're digging on that mountain and had we kind of looked back through our history we would find out that people have been digging on that mountain from day one and people will continue to dig on that mountain until it's moved. Uh, and that changes uh, how and when and so on. Uh, but um, so, so the party made, made the mistake of thinking that we could move that mountain in our lifetime when that's not the reality of what we're dealing with. And it wasn't the reality before we arrived. And it's certainly not the reality today. People are going to have to continue to dig on that mountain. Very well said. I mean, I think that all of us, the three of us in this conversation now, we all were in that moment where we thought the revolution was going to happen. <laughs> you know, we had these fantasies that we were going to storm the prison and free Eddie Conway. You know, I mean, that, that was going to be how it happened. But it, <laughs> but it didn't happen that way. Um, so let's take let's let's move move to 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 that that moment when um, when after all the trials and tribulations, all the times the push for Eddie to get you, to get you out and get you out of prison, it kept coming and going and coming and going, and the frustrations, all that. And then there was that moment when it actually was about to happen. And let me just add an anecdote here, Paul, if you don't mind, because you. It involves you and you remember you made a phone call to me and you also called this is a funny story you made a call to my first wife saida strongheart mm -hmm. telling us about this the, it, what was about to happen but none of us knew the other person knew mm -hmm. <laughs> and we all ended up in this courtroom with eddie being walked in and we were all there but kept the secret and then eddie was free mm -hmm. so you let's 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 wrestle with that for a minute i mean this this moment and eddie you walk out that prison door and i'll never forget the day when you walked out that prison door what happened to that relationship your relationship since that time and what the two of you have done in your lives and with each other since that moment you walked through that door w one of the things that well let me just start here because i think it's important for people to hear this and it's in the book mm -hmm. paul coach fell in love and moved to washington dc he had a house in Tioga Parkway, but he didn't sell that house. He kept that house for so, Eddie. Am I right? And yeah, Eddie so Mark, and Eddie, Eddie has Mark, a home. Yeah. So, so it, it's probably a little more romantic in the book. <laughs> and Eddie likes to make it romantic. You know? But you're going to get the, practical on this, right? The truth, the truth of the matter is, Eddie had been in jail for 40 some odd years. And yes, that house on Tioga Parkway was there. And I always, always knew that Eddie needed a residence. You know, that was going to be one of the things. Okay, so they said Eddie can come out, he needs a residence. That house was going to be his residence. That house was going to be his residence. And so the house was maintained so that it could be his residence. And fortunately it became, you know, his residence. The things happened. I had um I, I had moved to DC and, you know, in love and all this kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> I, I kind of like that man as an old man, as an as an elder in love. Yeah, I kinda like that. I had elder to think about good. it. I had to think about it for a minute. Yeah, but no, that that's cool. But it just was no question. There had to be a place. You don't, you don't struggle for that long and then not be a place. And so that's that's really all that there was um, about that. Um, there just had to be a place. There had to be a job. Eddie was going to work with me at um, Black Classic Press, something that we had talked about and looked forward to. 
it, as, as it turned out, other things opened up. And so fortunately, we, you know, we've been struggling for years. We're struggling to bring Eddie Conway home so that he can serve our community. And fortunately, when he came out the door, he immediately began serving the community and things began <laughs> opening up. And he's down to real news today because things opened up for this brother in a way that truth rises, you know, and, and consequently he's been rewarded. So that's really what 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 that was. It was part of the plan. You know, nothing romantic about it, nothing all of that about it. It's just part of the plan. Dominique came at the at the time when I, I had actually three support committees. They uh, <laughs> honest honestly, they were driving me crazy. They were, uh, the, you know, it was an international fight. There was a national fight, and then there was this local fight, and my hair was coming out. And uh, this this was uh, I had already like been in for like thirty three years, you know. And um, they were at at some point. I just said, like, look, you know, I'm shutting all of them down. Uh, I'm just gonna get some Star Trek books, and I'm gonna read books for the next twenty, thirty years, whatever it takes, until I get out, because I can't constantly deal with all of this struggle back and forth. Uh, you know, everybody had a program, everybody had an idea. And but it was always this constant infighting. Along comes Dominique and like said, hold up, just slow down, chill out. And we actually started working together. And that I think that was one of the things that's what endeared me to Paul, but that's what also endeared me to her. Because after she came back from South Africa and comrades over in South Africa say, that's a brother, get him out of jail. Um, and she came back looking and found me. And it was at that point that uh, part of, of my position always had been, yeah, I need help, but the conditions in this prison system is breaking, breaking down men and young boys in such a degree that we need to stop that. We need to figure out how to change the dynamics inside the prison. And because these are the same people that come back out in the community, angry, mad, frustrated, hostile, abandoned and broken. And that's always a bad combination to have in the midst of a community. So I said, let's if, if we can work together, then we'll work together in fixing this. And that's what happened. We started working together to fix that. And in the process of working together to fix it, I realized how brilliant she was. But also I realized that this was somebody in, because now by that time, I'm a senior citizen too. Uh, <laughs> and probably an elder at that time also. Yeah. <laughs> this is somebody I could actually love. And it made a different, it changed my life. But I want to jump for one minute from that. Mm -hmm. I want, yeah, I want to jump over to Paul and this house, the house that, that I'm sitting in now, uh, is that house that Paul saved. And I can clearly remember, and this is one of the things that kind of also endeared me to Paul, was that I kept insisting that Paul sell this house or rent it out to senior citizens, not realizing then that that was me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because it was such a, it was a, it was a burden. Paul was carrying it. He was, you know, paying it off. He was, he was keeping, you know, you have to keep the utilities on. He was doing all the taxes, the ground rent, the whole nine yards. And I said, Paul is just sitting there. It's mm -hmm. a liability. And it's it's not beneficial if you don't turn it into an asset. And Paul simply refused to do. He wouldn't listen. Most of the time he listened to me, <laughs> but he wouldn't listen to me that time. Um, and he just he was saying, "No, they'll somebody'll mess it up." 
It's, you know, just let, just leave it there. And that always, you know, and that was insight. That was mm-hmm. insight that I appreciated the first night I went to sleep here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, all right. The fact of the matter is, Eddie had a number of close encounters with getting out of jail. Yeah. I mean, he had a number of them, as you know. And uh, we get to the threshold and the rug get pulled out. We get to the threshold and the rug get pulled out. So the idea of of getting rid of a place that he could identify as his residence was not good <laughs> politics. You know, I mean, it just it just didn't it just didn't work, and that would not that just would not have worked. Um, so it made sense to hold on to the house, as far as I'm concerned. And about putting somebody in the house, we would have had to fight to get the person out. You know, not knowing when he was coming out the door and as it worked out, you know, that's precisely what it was. Um, If somebody, because when he got out, it was fairly quick compared to the long struggle and the other campaigns that we had run that we thought were going to work, you know. Um, So I'm just glad that that he's out, that he has a place. What 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 I hold is this, Mark. This is the whole thing about that house and the whole thing about commitment. Like we have strong, strong men. We have strong women also who will return to our community. I would just wish that they had the opportunity to have a kind of base of support uh, that Eddie has so that we can benefit as we're benefiting from Eddie being in our community, as opposed to just think, Mark, he could still be in jail. He could still be in jail and we would have no benefit. Being out, he's shown his benefit over and over and over to many people who don't even know uh, that he's their uh, beneficiary. So I'm just glad there was a platform for him to transition into and that was the plan, you know, that that was like the best of worlds. And I'm glad And he's fortunate enough to have a beautiful, smart wife and a beautiful family with that. So I'm just glad to have him back. I love him. You know, he is my brother. He is the brother that I choose, you know, Amen. if, I, if I can take his words. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I just want to say I said it first. <laughs> you did. You, you, did, did, you, did, you did. You did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> so let's conclude with this. I mean, I think I, I'm I'm curious about part of what you talk about at the end here. I was thinking about your your son Tanahashi coach wrote the afterwards of the book. Uh, a really beautiful afterwards of the book. Um, and one of the things in his afterward was talking about how in many ways, Paul, he, he talks about you as being more of a loner and into mm-hmm. books and into in, in seeing part of what you're doing to change the world is also the books you put out and what that does for people's consciousness. And Eddie, you're back and you're back in the street and building Tubman House by the projects and, and, and all the work you're doing. There's real news, but then after real news and haven't stopped doing that work. So you, you both take this revolution, as we talked about earlier, in different ways, but still very much in the mix. So talk about your reflections about now and where we are. One of the things I love about you, I think you, I think it was you, Paul, was talk, right, they're talking about how um, the, the issue of maleness and the movements in the past, especially the Panthers, that were a very male-dominated movement, how the world is really changing. And we're seeing a different thing. And it's maybe not as organized as, nationally as the Panthers, but things were sh- shifting and morphing into something brand new. So talk a bit about where you think all that is for us now, where we Mark, are. Mark, I want to, um, I don't know that I'll get that one. Correct, no, it's fine. But I, I, wanna, I, I definitely want to touch on something uh, because you brought up ta The thing I want to mention in that, in that forward that ta wrote was he gets something wrong. Okay. He gets something wrong. Folks, Uh-oh. look at what? What? Headlines, headlines, what? Headlines, what? Headlines. <laughs> headlines. <laughs> and he actually has written the right stuff before, you know. Um, but he talks about how I used to take him into, you know, his early memories of me taking him into the jail when he when he was young, when he was right. very young. Right. And the to to give full credit to it, 
a few weeks after he was born was the first time he went into the jail. His mother was the first one to take him into the jail. Hmm. And she took him into the jail to see Eddie because Eddie wanted to see the baby. Okay, <laughs> so, so we go back that far. And, and I, 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 look, this is important. This is important because when we're talking about maleness, when we're talking about maleness, it extends the family and it extends in the way of a wholeness. Eddie would come back and I don't think we have, yeah, Eddie does talk about this in, in, the, in the book. Wholeness again, you know, that circle goes around. There's this period in which ta getting ready to drop out of, out of uh, Howard or get kicked out of Howard. He probably wasn't dropping out because he used to go to Howard even when he wasn't enrolled. So he was just, just trying to get him straight or something, man. And um, there was opportunity to go down to visit Eddie to do this story he wanted to do or something. So I helped him do it. And Eddie talks about how he was supposed to talk to him about staying in school, getting on track and what have you. So he goes down to Jessup to visit Eddie. And he does this wonderful story on Eddie that's published in the uh, Howard University newspaper. And everybody says it's the bomb. He gets celebrated for writing this stuff. And consequently, he sees himself for the first time as a real writer, you know? And so huh. on, on, I'm, what, what I'm trying to say is this is circular. This is like fundamental about where the George Jackson prison movement goes and why today I still believe that some of our most brilliant, some of the most brilliant people we have are incarcerated. So Eddie gets to touch him as a baby and then he gets to touch him and put him on course as a young man. Mm. Um, I just think that's great and profound. And I hope, I hope as um, the history of one of our great writers is written, that when they talk about his father, they'll talk about his fathers, you mm. know, and how they touched him, you know? Very powerfully said, very powerfully said. I'm greatly encouraged, obviously, throughout all those uh, decades, I have been watching the growth and the weighing of the movement in terms of of uh, when people stepped up and when people kind of like this dropped off. Uh, today, we seem to be at a really historical crossroads uh, in America. Uh, you're looking at a, a more a push toward a more inclusive progressive society or you're looking at a really hostile fascist kind of dystopian future uh and it's up to young people young people have stepped up to the plate they're there uh, they're gonna have to learn they're gonna have to organize they're gonna have to to, to push back uh, meet the challenges that exist, but also there's an opportunity to to create a world in which we think would be beneficial to the whole planet. Uh, so I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged at this point, and uh, as even in the midst of a pandemic and um, a really craziness here, but uh, I'm encouraged that we'll come out the other side of that as a better people. I don't know what the process of going through there will be, but we're on our way. I, I do agree. And I, this has been a, 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 an important and joyous conversation for me to have with the two of you, Eddie Conway and Paul Coates and the, and the, and the book, The Brother You Choose. Thank you, Sushi Day, for making this book happen, first of all, for making these conversations happen and putting this together. It's just a marvelous book. But one of the best things to come out of that period that I've ever read. Uh, and uh, Paul Coates, Eddie Conway, Thank you all for joining us today and stay healthy, stay strong. And it was great to talk to you both. Okay. Thank thanks you. for having me. All Thank right. You. And folks, okay. this is the book. You need to read the book. Take care y'all. Okay. Thank okay. you, Mark. And Thank I'm you. Mark Steiner here on the Mark Steiner show for the real news network. Thank you all for joining us. Let us know what you think. Take care. <laughs>